Tony's been here with us several times, and uh, we appreciate his ministry and the friendship that God has uh, given us with him. It's been a blessing. Uh, he's always an encourager, lifts us every time we talk to him, and uh, just uh, enjoyed, got to meet Sherry for the first time, and we're thankful that she was here th with us this week. If you if you missed the marriage experience, they have a book on the back table about that uh, conference or really not a conference, it's an experience of the Grace Made Marriage. I, I recommend that to you, but we want to hone in to him this morning. Uh, let's get our Bibles out, your smart devices, whatever you're using to look at the scripture this morning and welcome Tony Sutherland as he comes to minister to us here at Grace Life. Thank you. Love you, man. Sure, sure, why not? Thank you. It's great to see this service filling up. It's great to be here in West Virginia. Um, 27 years ago, I met the prettiest girl on the, on the planet. And uh, we've been married, had wedded bliss for 27 years. Amen. Right? And uh, so we enjoyed being with your married couples this weekend. And if you didn't come, you need to come to the next one when I come back next year. Right? Part two. Part two. Um, so thankful for your ministry, Jamie and Lisa. Um, West Virginia needs a church that preaches the gospel of grace desperately. Um, and you are fulfilling a mandate. Your mandate. You're breaking new ground, and uh, you're pioneering not just a church building and a local church, but you're pioneering a movement. And uh, I believe it flows in your blood, the movement that your dad started will continue through you. I just prophesy that over you this morning. Um, it's, it's, it's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. That's why God chose you, because you recognize that. You know, God chooses people that recognize they can't do it. You know, like, me, God? Really? Um... And he will use you greatly. And uh, I just want you to be confident in everything that you're doing. Um, don't, don't think this isn't bigger than what it is. This is, this is big time right here. And uh, my wife and I are so blessed to be here. We're thankful and we're humbled that you have asked us to come share the word of God with you. And uh, Michaela was anointed this morning. I was so blessed and touched. And... Uh, don't ever doubt that you are making a difference here, ever. Um, you know, it's, 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 you know, the Lord, when, when God will assign you to a place, I just want to minister to this really quickly. Um, a God-given assignment is two things. It's a field, but it's also a furnace. It's a place where you're making a difference. But God is making a difference in you. And, and it's not, it's a place where you are, uh, producing, but it's also a place where you are being produced. Um, and, and, and if it ever gets anything other than that, then it's not a God-given assignment because to keep us real, God exposes us to the elements. Navigate it. Trust me. You know, when the finances aren't there, when the people don't seem to be with you, process it, navigate it. I'm with you. I'm, my favor is on you. Um, but you know, humility is the component of a God-given assignment. And through humility, God resists the proud, but gives much grace to people that humble themselves, accept their assignment, and run with it. Um, sometimes it's, you get location frustration, uh, vocation frustration. Um, and sometimes you want to take a vacation from the vocation. But this is all good, because it all turns out for the best. And God has great plans for this church. It's going to constantly be filling up, um, and uh, you're going to make a difference. And I hope this message will not only make a difference in you today, but that you will take it and make a difference in the lives of others. Our response isn't coming to the altar. Our response is going to the world. You know, a lot of people come and jump and shout, but how straight do you walk 
when you come down and hit the floor. Come on. So, so it's, it's, it's taking this gospel. You are the church. Pastor Jamie and Lisa are not the church. You are the church. They are equipping you to go out and take the gospel of grace and share it with the world around you. Every, everything you say to somebody is a sermon you preach, the way you live your life. And God wants to make a difference through you. I do want to th- take a few moments and just thank Pastor Jamie and Lisa for sowing into my life for the past two to three years financially. Um, you have blessed us. There will be times I'll go to the mailbox and open it up and there will be a check from Grace Life Church for Tony Sutherland Ministries. And we're so thankful. And um, they don't pay us a little bit. They give us, they, they compensate very well. And uh, your pastors believe in you and they believe in the ministries that come through this church and they want you to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So this morning I want to take a few moments and talk to you about what God is really like. What God is really like. You know, God gets, has got a bad rap in the world. God, God has got a bad... When, by the time it ciphers down from God through us, people have a distorted image of God. Typically it is, if they don't like you, they don't like God. Because you are the face. You are the representation of God. And throughout this message, there's going to be a mandate that comes on you. What am I going to say? How am I going to portray God to the world? How am I going to convince people that they're not the bad guy they really think he is? What God is. I used to think, I wanted to title this sermon at one time, What God is Really, Really, Really Like. Now, we're all growing in our knowledge and understanding of who He is, especially through the New Covenant, right? The New Covenant is our rule of faith and practice. It's how, you know, we're not going back to Moses. You know, I've moved my pulpit from Mount Sinai to Mount Calvary. Um, I am, you know, I don't want to see the glory of God like Moses saw the glory of God. We'll talk about that in a minute. You'll think, what do you mean? I... I want to portray God to the generation of who He really is. And I believe that that's what this church is about. God has established you for this reason. So we need to tell the world what God is really, really like. And we start in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 through 23. This is the first time that God tells someone about Himself. He's introducing Himself. Just like you would introduce yourself to somebody. Like Mexican food, I like football, I, you know, you describe yourself. And God is saying, I'm going to reveal myself for the first time to somebody, and he chooses Moses to do it. And in verse 18, it says, Moses said, please show me your glory, which means essence. Like, show me your essence. Your essence. Show me your essence, Lord. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Remember that. And I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. Now, the scenario here, here's the scene. Moses has already been up to the mountain. He's already received the Ten Commandments. And he comes down, he hears some noise and some celebration. It sounds like, you know, some, some music from the club. You know what I'm saying? The Israelites are down, down there getting jiggy with it, man. They're dancing around the, down, around the calf, the golden calf. They've had a party. There's prostitution. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And he recognizes it, that it's a strange fire burning and he's hearing the tambourines and the and and all this and he comes down there and they're dancing around an idol and Moses gets so angry and he picks up the Ten Commandments and he just throws it at the at the at the at the at the calf. He just gets mad and breaks it. Moses literally broke all the law right there. He got up to the mount. He was the most humble, righteous, God fearing Man, the Bible says that he was the most humble man on the earth. And in a moment of rage and anger at the people, you know, church would be a great place if it wasn't for the people. Come on now. 
Yeah. He picks up this, this, these commandments, and he just, just like he did, remember when he tapped the rock? He struck the rock, and God said, you need you to tap it. Worship leaders don't strike your people. Tap them. Sometimes they are looking at you. I say this to worship leaders all the time. You know, when you're leading people in worship, sometimes it looks like they're looking at you like you have egg on your face. It's like there, there's, there's no, lights on, nobody home. They say they're Christians. It just hasn't caught up with their face yet. And then they're, they're looking at you like, who in the world are you? You know, my mom told me something one time. She said, still waters run deep they're receiving it they're listening but sometimes i just want to i need somebody to lift your hands and sing do something okay you know even as a preacher you know you wonder if people are with you you know say amen or oh me you know so but the idea here is that moses broke the law this humble guy breaks the law and so now he's got to go back up the mountain to face God again. Isn't that so like we are when we break a commandment? And by the way, James 2 and 10 says, when you break one commandment, you've broken them all. So all of us have broken every commandment there ever was. And, and, and the thing about it is, is we've got to face God. Now, aren't you thankful that we can understand the old covenant through the new covenant? We don't have to put on old covenant lenses and, and, and know the new covenant. We put on the new covenant glasses so we can see what God was really like in the old covenant. And we better understand the old covenant. So Moses, so what we're, we have to have new covenant understanding right here. So all of us have gone back up the holy mountain of God and we've had to face God. Having broke all the commandments. Having failed God miserably. And I love it because I can see Moses right now. Moses is nervous. He's got to He's got to kind of go back up the mountain and goes, oh man, I, you know, God just put this whole show on with lights and brought his finger down and wrote on the sapphire stone. And I went down and I broke all the law. Now I got to go back up and ask God to give it to me again. And he gets back up there and I love what God's response is. Look what he says. He says, Moses is trying to change the subject. He's going, oh God, please, please show me. I just want to see you, Lord. I want to see your glory. Kind of change the subject and not get real. You know, sometimes when we come to God, we're not honest. You know, I say it like this. We all need to have a big gulp of honest tea with God, right? <laughs> And so Moses is trying to change the subject. He doesn't come up and say, God, I broke your law. I, I, I'm sorry. You know, I, you know, he just says, Lord, I just want to see your glory. And here's what God says. God could have blasted Moses. He could have said angry things with him. But here's what he says. He says, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. Now, see, the thing we learn about God here, this is what we call first mention. Anytime something is first mentioned in the Bible, it sets the pattern. See, when you get to know God, sometimes we don't represent God very well. Somebody may meet me on a bad day and see what a jerk I am. See my impatience and my grumpiness and my irritability and all the things, all the bad things that I try so hard to not show you, right? Right? You don't see me, you don't see me when there's bad things happening. You see me good. So now you're going to go out and say, man, Tony was the awesome he was the man. You should have been there. But see, if you see me on a bad day, now you've got first mention. So I could be a good preacher over here or sing well over here or do something great over here. But if you see me first and I'm bad, it kind of taints everything else. Oh, he's really a jerk, really. I mean, yeah, you liked him, right? But I know him, right? So, so but that's with God. So God is setting a precedent. He's saying, listen, if you really want to know who I am, spend some time with me. Get to know me. Because of all the, the, the quirks, I've got a whole lot of good things too. And you know what? You're going to be a little more gracious and kind with me when you see my faults and failures because you know who I really am, right? So God is saying, if you want to know me, go back to the source. And this is the first time. I love to go back and see what God first said about himself. I want to find out what, because that sets the precedent. And people think, you know, God was mean in the old covenant and he got real nice through Jesus in the, in the new covenant. But the Bible says he didn't change. I am God. I change not. I was never mad. I was never mean to people. I never disliked people. I never stopped loving people. I've always been good. And so when Moses comes in and breaks the commandment, God says, I'm just going to cause all my goodness to pass before you. Right there, we see the first time how God responds to failure, and it's by his goodness. Now watch what happens here. He says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name. See, God... See. 
what Moses needed, he went back up to get the Ten Commandments, but what God was about to do is talk to him about himself. See, God set Moses up. You know that, right? See, God, the Bible says that we got the law, not so that we could obey it, but to show us how far from perfection we really are. See, God didn't give us the law to say, okay, I'm giving you this law and I need you to measure up to it, because the truth is nobody can measure up to the law. It's impossible. People say, you know, living the Christian life is hard. No, living the Christian life is impossible. You have have to have Jesus. You cannot, you cannot live the Christian life without Jesus. And the truth is, listen to what I'm saying. This is very, very important. The law reminds us and makes it makes us more apt and prone to sin. So God gave Moses the law and knew he was going to break it. He gave Moses the law and knew that he would come up empty-handed. Isn't that how we all are when we try to obey the law and try to live up to the standard that God has set that we always come up empty-handed? Because the point is Jesus gave Moses the law to bring him back up into the mountain to show him that I'm incapable of keeping it and then God says okay instead of giving you the law which is what he went back up to get tell me again tell me can you remember what you said and he said I'm going to talk to you about myself I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass before you so he was setting a precedent that when we fail and when we break the law when we come into the presence of God we still get his undeserved goodness yes. can you give the Lord praise if you believe that this morning And then he says, I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I love that. Don't, 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 don't judge your neighbor. Don't judge people who have fallen. I'll be gracious to whom I've chosen to be gracious to. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. That's my choice. But he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not live. I love how some people think, well, the Lord can't show, couldn't show Moses' glory because it would have killed him. He was too holy. You know? No, God says, I'm too good. You can't handle it. That's the kind of goodness I like about God. When I come to God, God says, I'm so good, Tony. I'm about to drop something on you, and I'm so good. You're not going to be able to handle it, but get ready anyway, right? right. Yeah. Amen. And I love this part of it, too, is because he, so he hides him. He does him a favor. Now let's go to Exodus 34, 5 through 7. So the Lord, the Bible says the Lord descended in the cloud. So here it comes. The Lord is descending in the cloud, and he's about to show him his goodness. And he stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, if you look at that scripture, it doesn't make sense grammatically. How could the Lord proclaim the name of the Lord? It should say the Lord proclaimed his name. But it says the Lord proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, what, that, what that's a reference to is the Trinity. Because the Bible says in Genesis, let us make man in our own image. All right, so he's referring to the multiplicity of the divine nature of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then in another passage in Psalms, he says, The Lord said to my Lord, in Psalms 110 verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. The Lord said to my Lord. There's two lords talking here. He's a Lord talking to the other Lord. So it's the Father talking to the Son. Now watch what happens here. It says that the Lord descended in the cloud. I love this because Moses broke the law, but here comes the presence of God anyway and that's one thing we can always count on even when we break God's commandment and we disobey it's not that we live in that disobedience because the presence of God will always push us toward doing the right thing the presence of God will always lead us into what truth right he's not going to lead us back to falsity or a lie or false living the Holy Spirit will lead us to truth that's why your pastors are releasing the Holy Spirit in you because he will never lead you into mistruth come on somebody I love when you said one time and I watched you online he said we trust the Holy Spirit I don't trust you but I trust the Holy Spirit in you and if you listen if I train you to listen to the Holy Spirit it's nothing gonna but do nothing but produce good in your life come on somebody so so I love this right here I love this right here he says he proclaims the name of the Lord so what's happening here is God is introducing the Son for the first time in the Bible, this is the Son. Now, the Bible says that God has chosen to reveal Himself through Jesus Christ in these latter days. So that's God's choice. I'm going to reveal myself through Jesus. And God has always revealed Himself through Jesus. God has always revealed Himself through some form of Christophany in the Bible. Remember when the angel of the Lord came to Abraham? That was a Christophany. It was Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. See, Jesus did enter into a human birth, but He has always been from time and eternity 
eternity. He has, he has always been, always will be. So Jesus can show up in whatever form he wants to. And here God introduces his son to Moses. And he says, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. And guess what? All the goodness of God is in one person. His name is Jesus. Isn't that awesome? See... We talked a little bit in the first service about the glory of God. So God, so Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, I'll show you Jesus. Because in Jesus is the glory. The New Testament says, and we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So in the Old Covenant, nobody got to see the glory, no matter how well they lived, all the sacrifices and all the details of the law, and nobody ever got to go in and see the glory. But the Bible says in the New Covenant, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What the Israelites hoped for and never got to see, that hope lives inside of you. And we're not trying to get the glory to come down. We're not trying to press into the glory. We're not trying to strain or shake up the heavens to get the glory of God. The glory of God resides in you. So rather than press into the glory, we need to proclaim the glory that lives inside of you. Give Him a shout of praise, Grace Life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're proclaimers of the glory. This is the message that we tell the world. This is what God is really like. He is good. And all of His goodness lives in me. This is awesome. It's not a harsh message. It's not a message of condemnation and death. It's the good news that the good one lives in you. So the Bible says the Lord passed before Him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord a God, a merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Do you see what's going on here? There's nothing bad going on here. God's an angry God. God's a wrathful. He's a retributive God. He's a paying back God for what you deserve. No, he's just... Here's Moses broke the law and God is just dumping out Jesus, dumping out goodness, showing himself good, showing himself merciful, showing himself gracious. So instead of getting the Ten Commandments, God gives him his Ten Characteristics. Because here's the problem. There's two important things in life and a lot of people don't know what they are. That's a problem. Number one, your perception of God. There's a problem there. Everything, all you live out is all that you see God. Like the way you live and the way you respond in life, if you're afraid of God, you'll always be paranoid. You'll have your own theme music. Dum, 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 dum. You know, e- e- everything will just always be just, you know. And then the second most important thing in life is your perception of God's perception of you. So he's starting to get downloaded now with the goodness of God. So the number one thing, the first thing he's, I- I about God is that he is good. Right? So intense you can't handle it. Trust me. The Bible says, how excellent is thy name, O Lord. It's not good, just good, but he's excellent. That used to be a word we said back in the 80s, excellent. It was like one of these, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. (laughs) Psalms 23, watch this. Surely, Jesus said that a lot. Like, hey, you know, Jesus never really needed to say, hey, listen, I, I, I promise this will happen. Jesus never needed to say that, but he did because he wanted us to be confirmed. So he'd say, surely, surely, I say to you. Or verily, verily, if you're still in the King James. But he would say, surely, goodness and mercy will follow you. You can't get away from goodness and mercy. You go over here to the dark corner, goodness and mercy just comes in there. Because what, what does it say? It doesn't say condemnation would lead you to repentance. It says the goodness of God would lead you to repentance. That's the word we need to be telling people when we are communicating God to people. I know I messed up. You know how they come to you. They come to you and they just say, you know, I hadn't been in church for a long time. And, and it, that's all right. God still loves you. He's a good God. There's no condemnation. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of prodigals out there. They're still sons and daughters, by the way. They're in the pig pen. They're not disowned. They're just displaced. I need to come back to God. No, God's with you. You just need to come back to the family. You need to come back into fellowship with your community of faith so we can tell you the truth about who you are instead of believing the lie. You see, you're an eagle sitting in a chicken pen. 
And the Eagles ain't got no business. Come on, church. I feel the presence of the Lord right now. The Eagles ain't got no business sitting around pecking corn with the chickens. They need to fly like they were made to fly. Come on. And that's what we tell people when they're in the pig pen. Now, sometimes we see clearer through the pig pen. It takes us the journey getting there. But when you get to the end, guess what? There's nowhere else to go but up. Come on, somebody. Yeah. And we need to have the word of truth to tell people who they are. Get them prodigals to come back home. Listen, we got two Boston Terriers at home, right? They get out of the house and they run. They're gone. Do you think if I came down the road with a rope or something to whip them, they would come back? No. What I go? I go, treat <laughs> oh yeah and I'm coming back to the house with a treat right we set up electric fences sometimes to train dogs to stay in the yard what we go we got to turn that fence up that's what that's what co old covenant preaching is like I got to preach harder I got to preach the law I got to preach sin I, I had one guy tell me sometime we just going to go to Ukraine after I'd been over there mission he says can I preach sin over there I'm like bro why do you want to preach sin preach Jesus, Jesus. man yeah. that we called to preach sin we're called to preach the gospel. And it's like if my dogs, if I, if I put a steak on the oven and they can smell that coming through the window, the electric fence can be off. They smell the goodness. They go, I need to get over there. And that's the God we need to preach. It's the goodness of God that brings people back. It's a reminder that you're in a pig pen right now, but that's not who you are. You're not a pauper in the pig pen. You're a prince on the throne. You are seated with Him in heavenly places. He's a good God. Wherever God is, there's always good. The Bible says in Acts 10 and 38, And Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. He didn't bring the bad news. He didn't only bring good news, but He brought gifts along with Him. Come on, somebody. You deserve to be sick. You deserve to be where you are. But we're not going to talk about that. That's not what's going to get you up. I'm going to heal you undeserved, and I'm going to bring you out, and you will go and sin no more. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Give Him a shout of praise, Grace Life. Hallelujah. The sun, the Bible says in Hebrews 1 and 3, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact reputation of, representation of His being. Number two, God is merciful. Not just mercy, but full of mercy. Therefore, mercy full. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. There was multiplied to me. Na, 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 na. At Calvary. No condemnation at Calvary. The blood flows down to where I am. And it flowed down to where you are. And the blood, it gives me strength from day to day. Never, ever changes it. Never loses its power. Isn't God good? God always speaks from a place of mercy. When Moses went to the Ark of the Covenant, he talked with God from the mercy seat. Not the judgment seat. Not the anger seat. See, inside the Ark, the lid was the mercy seat. That's where, they, that's where God chose to dwell. King of God is God. God's got a messianic complex. He thinks He's God. He can sit wherever He wants to. So He said, I'm just going to sit with the angels. But I'm going to sit on mercy. And the Ten Commandments, the rod... And the manna, the golden bowl of rotten manna was in the, in the, it represented the sins of the people, the law, the rebellion against his leadership, of the rotten flesh, the, the manna. But it was in the mercy seat and God said, don't open it. I don't, if you open it, I, I, we're gonna, there's gonna be hell to pay. Because, here's why. Because I want the sins covered in mercy. We're not going to talk about them. We're not going to mention them. And the Bible says when the enemy, the Philistines, represented the devil in the Old Testament, when they captured the ark and brought it into Gilgamesh and opened the lid, that's what the devil does. He likes to open up that mercy and talk about your past, talk about your sins, talk about your failures. The Bible says 50,000 of them died that day. The Lord's goodness and mercy silences the voice of the enemy and puts to death his attack on your life. God always talks to us from a place of mercy. Can I hear an amen? 
The Bible says that God is gracious. He's not just gracious, but full of grace. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace is the truth. The Holy Spirit leads us to truth. What is the truth? It's the goodness of God. The Holy Spirit will never tell you what's wrong with you. He will always tell you what's right about you. He is our defending attorney. When the accuser is over there prosecuting us from his side of the courtroom, let me tell you, there's disorder in the court when Jesus stands up and says that he is innocent, he is blameless, he is guiltless, my blood covers his sins, and the Holy Spirit is your defending attorney. He is always standing up for you and speaking on your behalf. Yes, you were you, you failed. Yes, you're, you, you should be guilty, but I'm your defending attorney, and your job is to remain silent and let me defend you. Let me say what's right about you. Let me say what you what, who you are and where you are going. Come on, somebody. Any voice that is condemning, accusatory, judging, or angry is not the voice of God. The Holy Spirit. He gives you a new set of rights for your wrongs. He gives you a new set of rights for your wrongs. Number four, the Bible says... When God was revealing himself, he was slow to anger. Isaiah 54, 9 says God would no longer be angry with you. Why? Because he wasted it all on Jesus. All the anger that God had for your sins was put upon Jesus. Jesus got what you deserved and you got what he deserved. That's grace. The Bible says he is abounding in steadfast love. The Bible says it's not that we love God, but that he loved us. Old covenant preaching says you've got to love the God, Lord your God. Lord, love him. Love him, love him, love him, love him. 100%. Nobody loves God 100%. Nobody does. You know, guys, when you want to go fishing instead of going to church on Sunday, but you muster yourself to go to church on Sunday, in your heart you went fishing. So you can't love God 100% because he sees the peaks and the highs and the lows. He sees that it's not here all the time. He said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And Peter said, who then can be saved? See, the way we exceed the righteousness of, of the expectation is through Christ. He is our righteousness. Right. I'm not righteous. He's righteousness. And he is my righteousness. Right. I'm not righteous. He is. He said... So he says, it's not that we love God, 1 John chapter 4. It's not that I love God, it's that he loved me. That's the key right there. You see, here, here, listen to me very carefully. We try to shoot for responsibility before identity. Who I am determines what I do. And if I know who I am, then the what I do will take care of itself. We can live for God better on accident than we ever could on purpose. When we know who we are, our identity. See, God is with us, right? God is with us. He is Emmanuel, not a manual. We try to live by the rules. We're going to break them. But if we live with the constant awareness that his presence is with us, what happens? We live it out. This is why people have a bad rap of God. Because they don't see and hear and sense the goodness of God from us. And that's why this church is so important. Because the world will come to know Jesus and the goodness of God by the way we represent Him. Come on, represent. We need to represent Jesus with who He is. Not just with the t-shirt you wear, but the way we speak of Him. The way we talk of Him. The reputation we make of Him. Let's not, let's not, let's not make Jesus' reputation what it's not. Let's, live, let's make His glory known. Amen. This is awesome. He's faithful. The Old Testament said when we are faithful, he will be faithful. But the New Covenant says when I'm faithless, he yet remains faithful because he doesn't change. That's what God is really like. Number seven, he keeps his promises. I'm not saved by performance. I'm saved by a promise. God can't lie to himself. He's going to, listen, I know that I'm going to break my promises, but Praise God. I can trust my God that he will never break his promise. Paul said, I am persuaded that he, see the focus is on he. I am persuaded that he, not that I am able, but I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed. 
See, the thing is, I make a lot of commitments to God. I make a lot of promises to God. But I'm persuaded that I'm not able to keep all the promises that I've made. But I know that He will keep the promise He made. And it's not a salvation I keep. Listen, it's a salvation that keeps me. It keeps me. It locks me down. And people say, you can't be too sure of yourself. You can't, listen, you preach too much grace, people are going to go out and sin. You preach too much grace, people are going to get lazy, and they're going to get apathetic, and they're going to drop the ball. Listen to me, folks. Most sin is not based off of security. It's based off of insecurity. Therefore, we need to remind people how secure and how planted and how grounded they are. You can be totally, listen, I'm not too sure of myself, but I am sure of him come on somebody and that's the difference maker in the gospel that when I know that he will never let me go that nothing shall separate me from the gospel of Jesus Christ from his love when I know that and I'm convinced it's going to cause me listen folks it's not going to cause me to go out and sin it's going to cause me it's going to put a new energy in me and a new passion and a new vitality in me and from that knowledge of security and identity I can walk out my responsibility Somebody give him praise because you know it's true. Hallelujah. The Bible says he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Iniquity first, transgression, and sin. Well, he, he said it backwards. Well, at least he said it backwards on purpose. He forgives us of our sin, which is the state that we are born in. He forgives us of our transgression, which is when we step over the line, we commit error. And then iniquity is just all out lawlessness. But I love it when Jesus, when God says he forgives iniquity, he just went to the worst thing first. He just said, I, 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 I take it. Oh, and let's back up. Yeah, all those other little things, I got that too. But see, God goes to the worst of us. Come on now. He, when he went to the man at the pool of Bethesda, he went to the worst of the worst. I don't know about you. Bible starts out when it tells that story that one day Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad Jesus was on his way to my Jerusalem one day when I was sitting in a pool that was full of filth and full of mire. See, the pool of Bethesda was, was a sewer. It wasn't a spa. It was where lepers got in and it was where sick people dwelled and it was where thieves hung out. And it's where like, you know, the, the, the street guys that, that, that rob you and trick you from your money and all the dishonest business. It was in the Muslim quarters today it's the Muslim quarters it was outside of the city but Jesus is not afraid to go outside the camp to where people are old covenant says don't touch the unholy thing Jesus says find people where they are and tell them about my goodness go to the worst of these and the least of these come on somebody that's a mission that's that's your altar call today that's your altar call hallelujah praise you Lord and then number nine, he says, not clearing the guilty. You know, God, God is not bipolar. We think right there, God got mean. Like, I'm all good and everything, but I'm not going to clear the guilty. In the Hebrew, you know what that translates as? He will not ignore your sin. That's a good God. If, if God brings you into his fellowship, but then ignores your sin, he really doesn't care about you. See, sometimes it's time to get real with God. God, see, because grace doesn't point to your wrong, but what it does is it reveals our need for Jesus. And there's just certain areas of my life where I need Jesus. I'm not altogether lovely. He's altogether lovely. Come on, somebody. And so I need him to show up in the areas of my life. So I don't want him just to just write me off and say, oh, that's okay. Go ahead and be addicted to drugs, which I'm not. <laughs> just want to make that clear. Oh, it's okay, Tom. You can go ahead and do that. It's okay. No, it's fine. See, that's where people get mistaken that God just kind of lets us run like crazy. No, he doesn't. He corrals us into his love. And he begins to change us and, and transform us. The gospel, don't give the gospel a bad rap. If you're living one way and preaching the gospel, you're giving the gospel a bad name. Listen, show the world that grace transforms you. Amen. Toward holiness and right living. Holiness, listen, God's not grieved... The Holy Spirit isn't grieved by your sin because it hurts Him. It's grie grieving to Him because it hurts you. Right. See, there's a difference there. So He won't clear you, but He will help you and clean you. Number 10, it says visiting iniquity to the fathers and the sons and the sons' sons, even to the fourth generation, and so on and so on and so on. And here's how we've read that. He's going to come with a sword. <laughs> and He's coming for you, buddy. 
And he's going to do business with you if you don't get your business straight. He's going to visit your iniquity. You know, the word visit in Hebrew and in English both mean to check in on, to see about, to take care of. See, here's the thing. God is not offended by sin to where he can't get near it and he can't touch it. So he's going to visit you. And other, I remember when I was in high school, I used to get high. And I'd smoke pot and all that kind of stuff. I could never enjoy it because the Holy Spirit would just be talking to me the whole time. Tony, you know this isn't right. This is, this is not who you are. You're not a pot smoker, drug addict. You're a son. You don't, this is not you. And it's like, it's like, it, it, it's a, the hound, the Holy Ghost hound, just, just constantly. It's like, can you just leave me alone for a minute so I can just have some fun here and enjoy it? God said, this is not going to lead you down. Aren't you thankful that the Holy Spirit tags along with you wherever you go and he doesn't speak angrily or rudely he always reminds you who you are see tony this is not you it's not saying tony what are you you dumb what are you no he says this is not you this is not your purpose this is not your destiny and there's something about the presence of the holy spirit that will lead you on into truth so watch this watch this very carefully jesus doesn't come with anger he comes with mercy Michaela, if you and the team would come, Jesus doesn't come with disappointment. He comes with joy. Yeah. Jesus doesn't come with disgust. He comes with grace. Yeah. You know, I'm reminded of a story. You know, my brother and I were faking sick one day from school. It was when we were seniors in high school. We were faking sick. Actually, it was when we were sophomores because we were smarter when we were seniors. <laughs> we were sophomores in high school, and we were both faking sick on the same day. And my uncle was preaching a revival in our church. And he came down to see us. You know, because you know, back day in the, in the day, the evangelist stayed with you, you know. There was no such thing as putting you up in a nice hotel. And, and, and he came downstairs and he goes, boys, is everything okay? See, this reminds me of Jesus visiting our iniquity. See, when Jesus shows up, all of our excuses get exposed. Come on now. The, 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 the man at the pool of Bethesda says for 38 years he was at a pool. Now, now something's wrong with that. Because you think at 38 years he might have could have put his finger in the pool. Something. Mm -hmm. Or he could have at least got somebody to help him in. Of course, you know that you know through the Bible. I know this is a big theological departure here. But, that, but the water was never troubled. That was Hebrew tradi tradition. In fact, when you go back and read... Bibles that show the original manuscript that verse is not even there it was a it was a it was a it was an old wives tale and so when he when he was sitting at the pool Jesus said do you want to be made whole that'd be like me asking a homeless man in New York City if he wanted a blanket or some food the obvious question all right so my uncle comes downstairs and he says are, are, are you guys okay yeah we're okay we're okay we're just sick we're just sick he says well, do you want me to pray for you? And we were like, yeah. I love it too because my uncle was just the craziest, fun-loving. His hair looked like Bozo the Clown. He was always happy and always loving. You always felt like you were accepted around him. So I'm picturing sometimes that the Holy Spirit looks like my Uncle Gary. This big curly-headed comedian comes downstairs and in his own loving way he says do you want me to pray for you right and we were like yeah and he says now listen when I pray for you you're going to be healed yeah. there is listen you can people say you can run but you can't hide you can't even run from God the Bible says that he pursues us with a relentless love now, the truth of the story is, that story there, he, he point made, Uncle Gary, point made. And then he came down and he brought this big African blow dart gun. He says, I, I, I carry this with me where I go. I like to just go out and shoot this African. And he was shooting darts across our room into a wooden target that he keeps with him. And we were just like, this guy is nuts. Can you just leave us alone and let us sleep? But the point I'm making with that story is, is that God shows up always with love to expose us. He will visit the iniquity. He will visit you. And he, listen, he's checking in on you. He's coming to see about you. He's coming to love you. He's coming to help you. And he's coming to set you free. 
Jesus doesn't come with vengeance. He comes with forgiveness. Jesus doesn't come frustrated. He comes to set us free. Jesus doesn't ignore me. He hears my cry. Psalms 118 and 6. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God from help, for his help. From his temple, he heard my voice. He heard my cry. And my cry came before him into his ears. Can you stand up with me this morning? I want to ask you this morning. We're going to end with just a time of worship and declaration and proclamation of the goodness of God. But I want to ask you, will you be willing? We're not going to have an official altar call. I'm going to ask you this morning, would you be willing to take what you've heard today, the goodness of God, and respond by telling the world around you? Let this time of singing and worship that we are about to experience, let it inspire you and remind you. And I don't know where you are today, but I want to remind you that His goodness and mercy are pursuing you. I don't know, maybe you failed God this week. Maybe you've struggled in some areas of your life. Maybe you're struggling in your relationships. Maybe there's some addictions. Maybe there's some things in your life that you are really burdened with, but I'm here to tell you that it's the goodness of God that will transform you. Repentance is not just I'm sorry. The word repentance means to turn your life around all the way around. You may be going this way, but it's the goodness of this message in the worship, in the presence of God that transforms you. And I'm here to tell you today, you may be one way today, but God is about to change your life and set you on a new course. Can you just lift your hands? Let's just worship Him right now. Let's just give God praise. Come on, folks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Lord. And we're going to take this gospel to the world. Hallelujah. You're never going to let you're never gonna let me down. Come on, say. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. Cause you are good. Say. Good. never gonna let me down sing it out you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down oh you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let you're never gonna let Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my. Let's lift our hands and say, You are good. Good. Oh. Let the king of my 
my heart Be the fire inside my veins The echo of my days Oh, it's my song Cause you are so good Hallelujah Oh, you are good Good Oh, you are good Good saints come on lift up your voice say you are good so good nobody like you oh you've been so good yeah oh keep playing that keep playing that now i just want you to lift, lift your hands and just worship come on and declare how good god is in your life say you are oh yes lord we bless you we praise you, God. There's nobody like you. I wonder if somebody could lift up your voice and just begin to praise God in this place. Fill your heart with praises. Lift up your voice. Lift up your song. So good. So good. Nobody like you, Jesus. You are good. Come on, let's just praise him a little bit. Come on. Say you are good. Nobody like you. Hallelujah. Oh, we clap our hands. We lift up our voice and give you a shout of praise. There's nobody like you. So good, so good. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life. Oh, now come on and put your hands together and bless the Lord. Come on, church, give him about 30 seconds. Somebody. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Can you just throw your hands out and receive today the goodness of God into your life? Forgiveness and mercy and grace for every step. I'm going to speak this benediction over you, and then I'm going to turn it back over to your pastor. I want you to receive this today, but don't just receive it. Your altar call today is to take the goodness of God into the world around you. Share the gospel of Jesus. Don't give God a bad rap. If you fail, don't feel convicted. Or don't feel guilty and condemned over it tell people listen i know i'm a failure people say yeah look at look at you look at you you say yeah look at me agree with your adversary quickly yeah i fail god i'm not all i should be but my god still loves me and he forgives me and i'm a child of the living god lead them to the to jesus through the goodness of god the scripture tells us in isaiah chapter 55 verse 12 you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains, listen, that's a word, that's a promise. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you into shouts of joy. And the trees of the field will clap their hands. I wonder if anybody can just clap your hands and give God praise one more time. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you.